So welcome to part two of the lecture sequence on chapter six, uh, in, which is involving the physical chemistry of solutions. So picking up with section six five, real solutions activities. No actual solutions are ideal, and many solutions deviate from ideal dilute behavior as soon as the concentrations of solute rise above a small value. In thermodynamics, we try to preserve the form of equations developed for ideal systems so that it becomes easy to step between the two types of a system. This is, thought, this is the thought behind the introduction of the term activity. Well, well that, I'm just not trying to cross it out. Activity, which is the term A. In this case, A sub J for some species, J of a substance, which is a kind of effective concentration. The activity is defined so that the expression, which is follows in 615, in which the chemical potential for species J equals chemical potential plus RT times the natural log of the activity of species J. And this is true for all concentrations and for both the solvent and the solute. Now for ideal solutions, the activity of J equals the mole fraction of J, and the activity of each component is equal to its mole fraction. For ideal dilute solutions, using the definition in equation 619, activity of B equals the concentration of B over C, and the activity of the solute is equal to the numeric value of its molar concentration. For non-ideal solutions, we write the following. For the solvent, activity of A equals gamma times the mole fraction of A, and for the solute, activity of B equals gamma of B times the concentration of B over C, where gamma in each case is the activity coefficient. Both activities and activity coefficients are dimensionless. Activity coefficients depend on the composition of the solution, and we should note the following. Because the solvent behaves more in accord with Raoult's law as it becomes pure, the activity coefficient of A approaches 1 as the mole fraction of A approaches 1. Because the solute behaves more in accord with Henry's law, as the solution becomes very dilute, the activity coefficient of B approaches 1 as the concentration of B approaches 0. These conventions and relations are summarized in Table 6.2, which we can see right here, where we have a list of substances, solid, liquid, gas, and solute, standard states, and activities A for each of them. Now, Activities and activity coefficients are often branded as fudge factors. To some extent, that's true. However, their introduction does, does allow us to derive thermodynamically exact expressions for the properties of non-ideal solutions. Moreover, in a number of cases, it's possible to calculate or measure the activity coefficient of a species in solution. In this text, we shall normally derive thermodynamic relationships in terms of activities, but when we want to make contact with actual measurements, we shall set the activities equal to the ideal values in Table 6.2. So, colligative properties. An ideal solute has no effect on the enthalpy of solution in the sense that the enthalpy of mixing it is zero. However, it does affect the entropy by introducing a degree of disorder that is not present in the pure solvent, and we found in equation 6.6b that change in entropy is greater than zero when two components mix to give an ideal solution. We can therefore expect a solution, or excuse me, a solute, to modify the physical properties of the solution. Apart from lowering the vapor pressure of the solvent, which we've already considered, a non-volatile solute has three main effects. One, it raises the boiling point of the solution. 
just like salt being added to water. Two, it lowers the freezing point, analogously. Three, it gives rise to an osmotic pressure. The meaning of this last uh, will be explained shortly. Because these properties all stem from changes in the disorder of the solvent, and the increase in disorder is independent of the identity of the species we use to bring it about, for a given solvent, all of them depend on only the number of solute particles present, not their chemical identity. For this reason, they are called colligative properties, with colligative denoting depending on the collection. Thus, a 0.01 mole per kilogram aqueous solution of any non-electrolyte should have the same boiling point, freezing point, and osmotic pressure. So disregard that salt example because those are electrolytic solutions. I should have said a solution of sugar. Now, moving on to 6.6, the modification of boiling and freezing points expanding on these colligative properties. As indicated above, the effect of a sol solute is to raise the boiling point of solvent and to lower its freezing point. It's found empirically and is just by the calculation in der derivation 6.5 in the text that the elevation of the boiling point, delta T sub B, or change in temperature of boiling point, and the depression of the freezing point, change in temperature of freezing, are both proportional to the molality, B sub B, of the solutes. And we can see this in equation 617, where delta T boiling equals Kb times the molality of B, and delta T freezing equals K sub F, molality of B. Now, note that in table 63, we have these terms for K sub F and K sub B defined for different substances. K sub B is not only shown in the table, the ebullioscopic constant, and K sub F is the cryoscopic constant of the solvent. They're also called the boiling point constant and the freezing point constant, respectively. The two constants can be estimated from the other properties of the solvent, but both are best treated as empirical constants. To understand the origin of these effects, we'll make two simplifying assumptions. The first, the solute is not volatile and therefore does not appear in the vapor phase. And two, the solute is insoluble in the solid solvent and therefore does not appear in the solid phase. For example, a solution of sucrose in water consists of a solute, sucrose, that is not volatile and therefore never appears in the vapor, which is therefore pure water vapor. The sucrose is also left behind in the liquid solvent when ice begins to form, so the ice remains pure. The origin of colligative properties is the lowering of chemical potential of the solvent by the presence of a solute. We saw in section 5.3 that the freezing and boiling points correspond to the temperature at which the graphs of the Molar-Gibbs energy of the liquid intersects the graphs of the Molar-Gibbs energy of the solid and vapor phases, respectively. Because we're now dealing with mixtures, we have to think about the partial Gibbs energy, the chemical potential, of the solvent. The presence of a solute lowers the chemical potential of the liquid, but because the vapor and solid remain pure, their chemical potentials remain unchanged. As a result, we see from figure 616 that the freezing point moves to lower values. Likewise, from figure 617, we see that the boiling point moves to higher values. In other words, the freezing point is depressed, the boiling point is elevated, and the liquid phase exists over a wider range of temperatures. Let's take a look at this 616. On the x-axis, we have the chemical potential, and on the y-axis, we have the temperature. And we have three different lines. We have a line in orange for the pure liquid solvent, a line for green, which is solvent in solution, and we have the red line, which is the pure solid solvent. 
the chemical potentials of pure solid solvent and pure liquid solvent also decrease with temperature. And the point of intersection where the chemical potential of the liquid rises above that of the solid marks the freezing point of the pure solvent. A solute lowers the chemical potential of the solvent, but leaves that of the solid unchanged. As a result, the intersection point lies further to the left, and the freezing point is therefore lowered. Likewise, in 617, we see the chemical potentials of pure solvent vapor and pure liquid vapor decrease with temperature, and the point of intersection where the chemical potential of the vapor falls below that of the liquid marks the boiling point of the pure solvent. A solute lowers the chemical potential of the solvent, but leaves that of the vapor unchanged. As a result, the intersection point lies further to the right, and the boiling point is therefore raised. Now, I'd like to reiterate the reason we see this broadening of the range of temperatures over which the liquid state exists via depressing the freezing point and elevating the boiling point is because that the solute effects only extend in the liquid phase and are excluded from modifying the vapor phase or the solid phase. Now, the elevation of boiling point is too small to have any practical significance. A practical consequence of the lowering of the freezing point and hence the lowering of the melting point of a pure solid is its employment in organic chemistry to judge the purity of a sample, for any impurity lowers the melting point of a substance from its accepted value. The salt water of the oceans freeze at temperatures lower than that of fresh water, and salt is spread on highways to delay the onset of freezing. The addition of antifreeze to car engines and by natural processes to arctic fish is commonly held up as an example of lowering freezing point, but the concentrations are far too high for the arguments we have used here to be applicable. The 1,2-ethanediol or glycol used as antifreeze and the proteins present in fish body fluid probably simply interfere with bonding between water molecules as a mechanism for changing their freezing point. Now, another interesting mechanism, because we mentioned the oceans having a depressed freezing temperature, but we see that they do freeze. However, upon freezing, they do exclude the salts largely, creating pockets of highly concentrated salt just under the ice. And this is more dense water than the water below it. And it reaches these layers of density, which then descend, pushing these layers down along the ocean floor and causing deep sea currents. And it's these repeated freezing events at the poles which occur in the absence of global warming, which help drive, de drive these deep sea currents, which interplay with the surface currents to stabilize temperature along the middle of our uh, earth, which where we farm a lot of our food. So there's a lot of uh, interesting ecological outcomes to these processes as well. Now, moving along to osmosis. The phenomenon of osmosis, from the Greek word for push, is the passage of a pure solvent into a solution separated from it by a semipermeable membrane. A semipermeable membrane is a membrane that is permeable to the solvent, but not the solute. The membrane might have microscopic holes that are large enough to allow water molecules to pass through, but not ions or carbohydrate molecules with their bulky coating or hydrating water molecules. The osmotic pressure, uppercase pi, is the pressure that must be applied to the solution to stop the inward flow of solvent. Now, it's an old cartoon, but there's an old Simpsons cartoon where Bart's trying to learn through osmosis by putting his head on a textbook. And I want to point out that to learn through osmosis would require that knowledge be a liquid and that you were able to immerse your head in it. In the case of what Bart's trying to do, he's hoping for learning through diffusion. So, never confuse your osmosis and diffusion. In the simple arrangement shown in figure 619, 
the pressure opposing the passage of solvent into the solution arises from the hydrostatic pressure of the column of solution that the osmosis itself produces. This column is formed when the pure solvent flows through the membrane into the solution and pushes the column of solution higher up the tube. Equilibrium is reached when the downward pressure exerted by the column of solution is equal to the upward osmotic pressure. A complication of this arrangement is that the entry of solvent into the solution results in dilution of the latter, so it's more difficult to treat mathematically than an arrangement in which an externally applied pressure opposes any flow of solvent into the solution. The osmotic pressure of a solution is proportional to the concentration of solute. In fact, we show in derivation 6.6 in the text that the expression for the osmotic pressure of an ideal solution, which is called the Van't Hoff equation, bears an uncanny resemblance to the expression for the pressure of a perfect gas, where the osmotic pressure, uppercase pi, times volume, is proportional to the number of moles of B times RT. Because the ratio of number of moles of B per unit volume equals concentration of B, the molar concentration of the solute, a simpler form of this equation, is 618B, where the osmotic pressure is equal to the concentration of B times RT. This equation applies only to solutions that are sufficiently dilute to behave as ideal solutions. Osmosis helps biological cells maintain their structure. Cell membranes are semi-permeable and allow water, small molecules, and hydrated ions to pass while blocking the passage of biopolymers synthesized inside the cells. The difference in concentrations of solutes inside and outside the cell gives rise to an osmotic pressure and water passes in to the more concentrated solution in the interior of the cell, carrying a small nutrient molecule. The influx of water also keeps the cell swollen, whereas dehydration causes cells to shrink. One of the most common applications of osmosis is osmometry, the measurement of molar masses of proteins in synthetic polymers from the osmotic pressure of their solutions. As these huge molecules dissolve to produce solutions that are far from ideal, we assume that the Van Hoft equation is only the first term of an expansion, which we see in 619a, where we have the Van Hoff equation followed by an expanding sequence of terms. Exactly the same strategy was used in section 112 to extend the perfect gas equation to real gases, and there it led to the virial equation of state. The empirical parameter b in this expression is called the osmotic virial coefficient. To use equation 619a, we rearrange it into a form that gives us a straight line by dividing both sides by the concentration of B. As we illustrate in example 6.4, we can find the molar mass of B by measuring the osmotic pressure at a series of mass concentrations and making a plot of the osmotic pressure over concentration of B against B. And we see this in figure 6.2.1 where on the y-axis we have osmotic pressure divided by the concentration of B, and on x we have the molar concentration of B. We also see um, mass concentration as well on the right. Now, when pressure greater than the osmotic pressure is applied to the solution, there's a thermodynamic tendency for the solvent to flow out of the solution and into the pure solvent. This process is called reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is of great importance for the purification of seawater so that it is potable or drinkable and can be used for irrigation. And many reverse osmosis plants are in operation around the world to supply fresh water to arid or water deficient regions. The principle technical problem is to manufacture semi-permeable membranes that are strong enough to withstand the high pressures required but still allow an economic flow. So let's take a look at this example which we referred to in 6.4 using osmometry to determine molar mass. The osmotic pressure of a solution of an enzyme in water at 298 Kelvin are given below. 
determine the molar mass of the enzyme. So we have our data. In the first row, we have the mass concentration of C in grams, uh, decimeters cubed, and below that, we have the osmotic pressure, uh, capital Pi in Pascals. So the strategy for this, first we need to express equation 619 in terms of mass concentration, C. The molar concentration, or concentration B of the solute, is related to the mass concentration by the mass concentration for species B equals the mass of B divided by volume, which is what we're seeing here. And that can be extended so that the concentration of B equals the mass concentration of B divided by its molar concentration, which is what we see here. With the substitution, equation 619 becomes, wow, that is a terrible check mark. Let me erase that. The following division through by M gives us the following, where we've removed M here, added it here, removed it, or and then divided it. So we got our square here, and we see the output of that below. It follows that by plotting the first term. We have y equals mx slope times x and b as our intercept. And that's what we're seeing in figure 622. The plot of the data in example 65, the molar mass is determined from the intercept at c equals 0. So our intercept is going to give us our molar mass. I think I just skipped ahead. However, let's take a look at the detailed solution. The following values can be calculated from our data. We have the original data, which we show, and the points are plotted in figure 622. The intercept with the vertical axis at C sub e equals zero, which is best found using linear regression and mathematical software, is at 19.6, which we can rearrange to into 19.6 pascals per gram decimeter cubed. Now, this also can be arranged to meter squared per second squared. Therefore, this intercept is equal to RT over M, so that M equals RT over intercept. And we can write that as the following, and we can substitute we have our ideal gas law constant. We know this is 298. And we have our term m, which is 19.6 meters squared per second squared. And this gives us 126 kilograms per mole. The molar mass of the enzyme is therefore close to 130 kilodaltons. Let's move on and take a look at phase diagrams of mixtures. As in the discussion of pure substances, chapter five, the phase diagram of mixture show which phase is most stable for given conditions. However, for mixture com mixtures, composition is a variable in addition to the pressure and temperature. It will be useful to keep in mind the implication of the phase rule, F equals C minus P plus two from section 5.7. We shall consider only binary mixtures, which are mixtures of two components, such as ethanol and water, and therefore set C equals to 2, then F equals 4 minus P. For simplicity, we keep the pressure constant at one atmosphere, for instance, which uses up the degree of freedom, and write F prime equals 3 minus P for the number of degrees of freedom remaining. 
One of these degrees of freedom is the temperature, and the other is composition. Hence, we should be able to depict the phase equilibria of the system on a temperature composition diagram in which one axis is the temperature and the other axis is the mole fraction. In a region where there is only one phase, F prime equals two, and both temperature and composition can be varied. And we see that in figure 623. If two phases are present at equilibrium, F prime equals one, and only one of the two variables may be changed at will. For example, if we change the composition, then to maintain equilibrium between the two phases, we have to adjust the temperature too. Such two-phase equilibria therefore define a line in the phase diagram. If three phases are present, F prime equals zero, and there's no degree of freedom for the system. To establish equilibrium between three phases, we must adopt a specific temperature and composition. Such a condition is therefore represented by a point on the phase diagram. So let's take a look at these phase diagrams. In figure 623, the interpretation of a temperature composition phase diagram at constant pressure is shown. In a region where only one phase is present, F prime equals two, and both composition and temperature can be varied. On a phase boundary, where two phases are in equilibrium, F prime equals one, and only one variable can change independently. At a point where three phases are present in equilibrium, F equals zero, and the temperature and composition are fixed, which is what we're seeing here in the center. Now, figure 624, a temperature composition diagram is shown for a binary mixture of volatile liquids. The tie line connects the points that represent the compositions of liquid and vapor that are in equilibrium at each temperature. The lower curve is a plot of the boiling point of the mixture against the composition. Now, moving along to the mixture of volatile of liquids. First, we consider the phase diagram of a binary mixture of two volatile components. This kind of system is important for understanding fractional distillation, which is widely used technique in industry and the laboratory. Intuitively, we might expect the boiling point of a mixture of two volatile liquids to vary smoothly from the boiling point of one pure component when only the liquid is present to the boiling point of the other pure component when only that liquid is present. This expectation is awfully born out in practice. And in figure 624, you know, which we've shown already, shows a typical plot of boiling point against composition. The vapor in equilibrium with the mixture is also a mixture of two components. We should expect the vapor to be richer than the liquid mixture in the more volatile of the two substances. This difference is also often found in practice, and the upper curve in the illustration shows the composition of vapor in equilibrium with the boiling liquid. To identify the composition of the vapor, we note that the boiling point of the liquid mixture, point A for instance, and draw a horizontal tie line, a line joining two phases that are in equilibrium with each other across the upper curve. Its point of intersection, A prime, gives the composition of the vapor. In this example, we see that the mole fraction of A in vapor is about 0.6. As expected, the vapor is richer than the liquid in the more volatile component. Graphs like these are determined empirically by measuring the boiling points of a series of mixtures to plot the lower curve of boiling point against composition and measuring the composition of the vapor in equilibrium with each boiling mixture to plot the corresponding points of the vapor composition curve. We can follow the changes that occur during the fractional distillation of a mixture of volatile liquids by following what happens when a mixture of composition A1 is heated, which we state in 625. The mixture boils at A2. 
and its vapor has a composition of A prime 2. This vapor condenses to a liquid of the same composition when it has risen to a cooler part of the fractionating column, a vertical column packed with glass rings or beads to give it a large surface area. This condensate boils at the temperature corresponding to the point A3 and yields a vapor of composition A prime 3. This vapor is even richer in the more volatile component. That vapor condenses to a liquid that boils the temperature corresponding to A4. The cycle is repeated until an almost pure A emerges from the top of the column. So let's see if I can provide a little bit of a, a crude illustration. Of what a fractional distillation system may look like. Let's say we have our liquid here, which is our mixture with a variable boiling point. And we have a heat source underneath. And we have the liquid moving into vapor phase and also ability to condense back into liquid phase, denoted by the reversible arrows. And here we have these plates, A, B, C, D, etc., that are perforated plates. And as we move up the column, we go from a higher temperature area to a lower temperature area. So we build up a quantity of vapor A. So at temperature um, with mole fraction of A, which we see here, if we heat it to temperature T, which is our A2, it's going to move up, move through this plate, and then as it moves through the plate at temperature A2, it will have a composition of vapor by A prime 2. Now, that composition of vapor is going to be richer in the volatile component of the mixture. And when it condenses, we'll say it condenses back down here reversibly, we have now, and this is more dynamic than it's drawing in, a body of liquid above this permeable uh, plate, which has a different boiling point of mixture than it did below. And that boiling point of mixture is our A3. Now when that's heated at that lower column temperature, it moves up to B, which will give us a prime 3, which will give us yet a different mole fraction of x, or mole fraction of a, which will have a different ratio of volatile to non-volatile or less volatile, which will then vaporize at a lower temperature up the column. And these perforated plates are also able to drain down through and they're stabilized by temperatures. It's a little bit more complex than being drawn. But as we move up the column, we're getting more progressively more and more volatile component in our mole fraction, which is the essence of how fractional distillation works. So the process of fractional distillation, let me get rid of these go through this one more time, can be represented by a series of steps of a temperature composition diagram, which we're seeing here. The initial liquid mixture may be at a temperature and have a composition like that represented in point A1. It boils at temperature T2, and the vapor in equilibrium with this boiling liquid has composition of A prime 2, which is what we're seeing here. If that vapor is condensed to A3 or below, the resulting condensate boils at temperature 3 and gives rise to a vapor of composition represented by A prime 3. As the succession of vaporization, the condensation is continued, the composition of the distillate moves towards pure A, the more volatile of the two components. Now, 
whereas many non uh, many binary liquid mixtures do have temperature composition diagrams resembling that of figure 625. In a number of important cases, there are marked differences. For example, a maximum in the boiling point curve is sometimes found, as we see in 626. This behavior is a sign that favorable interactions between molecules of the two components reduce the vapor pressure of the mixture below the ideal value. Examples of this behavior include trichloromethane, propanone, and nitric acid with water mixtures. Temperature composition curves are also found that pass through a minimum, which we see in 627. This behavior indicates that the AB interactions are unfavorable and hence the mixture is more volatile than expected on the basis of simple mingling of the two species. Examples can include dioxin in water and ethanol in water in this case. And of course, ethanol water is of particular importance if you're interested in the distillation of alcoholic spirits or the distillation of ethanol as a fuel from aqueous mixtures. Now, let's take a look at these. In figure 626, the temperature composition diagram for high boiling azeotropes, as fractional distillation proceeds, the composition of the remaining liquid moves towards A4, which we see here. However, once there, the vapor in equilibrium with that liquid has the same composition, so the mixture evaporates with an unchanged composition and no further separation can be achieved. In 627, the temperature composition diagram for the low boiling azeotrope, as fractional distillation proceeds, the composition of the vapor moves towards A4. However, once there, the vapor in equilibrium with that liquid has the same composition, so no further separation of the distillate can be achieved. There's a maximum degree of purification in the distillation of ethanol from water. There's a maximum concentration of ethanol you could obtain through this distillation. You're never going to be able to distill ethanol from water to 100% because of this minimum in its azeotropic interaction. There are important consequences for distillation when the temperature composition diagram has a maximum or a minimum. Consider a liquid of composition A1 on the right of the maximum in figure five, uh, 625. It boils at A2 and its vapor of composition A2 is richer in the more volatile component A. If that vapor is removed, the composition of the remaining liquid moves towards A3. The vapor in equilibrium with this boiling liquid has composition A3. Note that the two compositions are more similar than the original pair. If that vapor is removed, the composition of the boiling shifts towards A4 and the vapor of that liquid mixture has a composition identical to that of the liquid. At this stage, evaporation occurs without change of composition. The mixture is said to form an azeotrope, which is from the Greek word for boiling without change. When the azeotropic composition has been reached, distillation cannot separate the two liquids because the condensate remains the composition of the liquid. One example of azeotropic formation is hydrochloric acid in water, which is azeotropic at 80% water by mass and boils unchanged at 108.6 degrees Celsius. The system shown in figure 6 to 7 is also azeotropic, but it shows the character in a different way. Suppose we start with a mixture of composition A1 and follow the change of the composition of the vapor that rises through fractionating column. So we're starting with A1. The mixture boils at A2 to give a vapor of composition A2. prime This vapor condenses in the column to a liquid of the same composition, now marked A3. That liquid reaches equilibrium with its vapor at A prime 3, which condenses higher up the tube to give a liquid of the same composition. The fractionation, therefore, shifts the vapor towards the azeotropic composition at A4, but the composition cannot move beyond A4 because now the vapor and the liquid have the same composition. Consequently, the azeotropic vapor emerges from the top of the column, 
An example of this is ethanol in water, which boils unchanged when water content is 4% and the temperature is 78 degrees Celsius. Now, on to liquid-liquid phase diagrams. Partially miscible liquids are liquids that do not mix together in all proportions. An example of a mixture of hexane and nitrobenzene. When two liquids are shaken together, the liquid consists of two liquid phases, one in a saturated solution of hexane in nitrobenzene, and the other is a saturated solution of nitrobenzene in hexane. Because the two solubilities vary with temperature, the composition and portions of the two phases change as the temperature is changed. We can use a temperature composition diagram to display the composition of the system at each temperature. Suppose we add a small amount of nitrobenzene to hexane at temperature T prime. The nitrobenzene dissolves completely. However, as more nitrobenzene is added, a, a stage comes where no more dissolves. The sample now consists of two phases in equilibrium with each other. The more abundant one consists of hexane saturated, saturated with nitrobenzene. The less abundant one is a trace of nitrobenzene saturated with hexane. In the temperature composition diagram drawn in figure 6 to 8, the composition of the former is represented by the point A prime and that of the latter by a double prime. The relative abundance of the two phases are given by the lever rule, which is equation 6-2, where the amount of phase of composition a double prime over the amount of phase of composition prime equals L prime over L double prime. Let's take a look at figure 6 Two eight, and then six, figure six two nine. In figure six two eight, we have on the y-axis temperature, and on the x-axis mole fraction. The temperature composition diagram for hexane and nitrobenzene is shown at one atmosphere. The upper critical solution temperature, T U C, is the temperature above which no phase separation occurs. For this system, it lies at 293 Kelvin when the pressure is one atmosphere. That's what we're seeing right there. Now, for 629, the coordinates and compositions referred to by the lever rule are drawn here, where we have L prime and L double prime intersecting with A prime and A double prime. When more nitrobenzene is added to the two-phase mixture at temperature T prime, hexane dissolves in it slightly. The overall composition moves to the right in the phase diagram, but the composition of the two phases in equilibrium remain A prime and A double prime. The difference is that the amount of the second phase increases at the expense of the first. A stage is reached when so much nitrobenzene is present that it can dissolve all the hexane and the system reverts to a single phase. Now the point representing the overall composition and temperature lies to the right of the phase boundary in the illustration and the system is a single phase. The upper critical solution temperature or TUC, which is also called the upper consolute temperature, is the upper limit of temperature at which a phase separation occurs. Above the upper critical solution temperature, the two components are fully miscible. In molecular terms, this temperature exists because the greater thermal motion of the molecules leads to greater miscibility of the two components. In thermodynamic terms, the Gibbs energy of the mixing becomes negative above a certain temperature regardless of the composition. So in this example, above 293, we don't have phases because we achieve full miscibility. Some systems show a lower critical solution temperature, TLC, which is also called the lower consolute temperature, 
below which they mix in all proportions, and above which they form two phases. An example is water and triethylamine, and we see this in figure 630. In this case, at low temperatures, the two components are more miscible because they form weak complex. At higher temperatures, the complexes break up and the two, com two components become less miscible. A few systems have both upper and lower critical temperatures. The reason can be traced to the fact that after the weak complexes have been disrupted, leading to partial miscibility, the thermal motion at higher temperatures homogenizes the mixture again, just as in the case of ordinary partial miscible liquids. One example is nicotine in water, which are partially miscible between 61 degrees Celsius and 210 degrees Celsius, and that's shown in figure 631. Now, moving on to liquid solid phase diagrams. Phase diagrams are also used to show the regions of temperature and composition at which solids and liquids exist in binary systems. Such diagrams are useful for discussing the techniques that are used to prepare the high purity materials used in the electronics industry and are also of great importance in metallurgy. Hobby of mine. Figure 632 shows a simple phase diagram for an alloy of two metals that are miscible in all proportions. The liquidus is the line above which the entire sample is liquid. The solidus is the line below which the sample is entirely solid. When a sample of composition and temperature A1 is cooled at A2, it initially deposits a solid of composition B2. As the temperature is lowered, the equilibrium composition of the deposited solid moves towards B3, and that of the remaining liquid moves towards A3. Below the solidus, only solid of the original composition is present. So let's take a look at that. Figure 632, the phase diagram for an alloy formed from two metals with normal belting points, Ta and Tb, in their pure form, that are miscible in all proportions in the liquid and solid phase. And we can see on the y-axis we have our temperature, on the x-axis we have our mole fraction of A, and you can see how we move back and forth between the solids and liquid lines um, as described previously. Now, phase diagrams such as these are constructed by monitoring the cooling curve at a series of compositions, and that's figure 633. The different slopes of the liquid phase and solid phase cooling curves is due to their different heat capacities, the rate at which energy is lost as heat from a sample is proportionate to the temperature between difference between it and its surroundings, and the corresponding change in temperature of the sample will be large if the heat capacity is small. So, meaning if you have a high heat capacity, it takes more thermal energy put in to raise the temperature. Conversely, if you have a low heat capacity, as you put energy into the system, of that material, the temperature goes up relatively easily or quickly. And this is why metals often have lower heat capacities, so they heat relatively quickly with thermal energy, whereas insulators such as water require a substantial amount of thermal energy to heat the uh, similar amount of um, temperature. Cooling to the temperature of the surroundings also slows if the surroundings are at a constant temperature. The changing slope between the temperatures corresponding to the liquidus and the solidus is due to the exothermic character of the phase transitions. The progressive release of heat as the solid forms retards cooling. Figure 634 shores a portrayal of the sequence of cooling curves plotted against the initial composition of the liquid, but with the time dependence removed. By joining the points that terminate each cooling region, the liquidus and solidus can be constructed. Figure 635 shows the phase diagram for a system composed of two metals that are almost completely immiscible, right up to their melting points, such as antimony and bismuth. Consider the molten liquid of composition A1. When the liquid is cooled to A2, the system enters two-phase region labeled liquid plus A. 
almost pure solid A begins to come out of solution, and the remaining liquid becomes richer in B. In cooling to A3, more of the solid forms and the relative amounts of the solid and liquid, which are in equilibrium, are given by the lever rule. At this stage, there are nearly equal amounts of each. The liquid phase is richer in B than before, its composition is given by B3, because A has been deposited as solid. At A4, there's less liquid than at A3, and its composition is given by E. This liquid now freezes to give a two-phase system of almost pure A and almost pure B, and cooling down to A5 leads to no further change in composition. The vertical line through E in figure 635 corresponds to the eutectic point, in the Greek words easily melted. A solid with eutectic composition melts with any change of composition at the lowest temperature of any mixture. Solutions of composition to the right of E deposit A as they cool, and solutions to the left deposit B. Only the eutectic mixture, apart from pure A and B, solidifies at a single definite temperature without gradually unloading one or the other components from the liquid. Our technologically important eutectic is solder, which typically consists of about 67% tin and 33% lead by mass and melts at 183 degrees Celsius. Eutectic formation occurs in the great majority of binary alloy systems. It's of great importance for the microstructure of solid materials, for although a eutectic solid is a two-phase system, it crystallizes out in a nearly homogeneous mixture of microcrystals. The two microcrystalline phases can be distinguished by microscopy and structural techniques such as X-ray diffraction, which we'll discuss in future chapters. Cooling curves are used to detect eutectics. We can see how it is used by considering the rate of cooling down the vertical line at A1 in figure 635. The liquid cools steadily until it reaches A2. Then A begins to be deposited. Cooling is now slower because the solidification of A is exothermic and retards the cooling, which is what we're seeing in figure 636. When the remaining liquid reaches the eutectic composition, the temperature remains constant until the whole sample has solidified. This pause in the decrease in temperature is known as the eutectic halt. If the liquid has the eutectic composition E initially, then the liquid cools steadily down to the freezing temperature of the eutectic when there is a long eutectic halt as the entire sample solidifies, just like the freezing of a pure liquid. Phase diagrams are important for representing the processes used to get ultra-pure materials for use in the semiconductor industry, which we discuss in box two. So let's discuss this box two, which is ultra-purity and controlled impurity. Advances in technology have called for materials of extreme purity. For example, semiconductor devices consist of almost perfectly pure silicon or germanium doped to a precisely controlled extent. For these materials to operate successfully, the impurity level must be kept down to less than 1 in 10 to the 9th. The technique of zone refining makes use of the non-equilibrium properties of mixtures. It relies on the impurities typically being more soluble in the molten sample than in the solid, and sweeps them up by passing a molten zone repeatedly from one end to the other along a sample. In practice, a train of hot and cold zones are swept repeatedly from one end to the other. The zone at the end of the sample is the impurity dump. When the heater has gone by, it cools to a dirty solid that can be discarded. We can use a phase diagram to discuss zone refining, but we have to allow for the fact that the molten zone moves along the sample, and the sample is uniform in neither temperature nor composition. Consider a liquid, which represents the molten zone, on the vertical line in A3 in the second illustration, and let it cool without the entire sample coming to overall equilibrium. If the temperature falls to A2, a solid of composition B2 is deposited, and the remaining liquid, the zone where the heater has moved on, is at A'2. Cooling that liquid down 
to a vertical line passes through A prime two, deposits solid of composition B three and leaves liquid at A prime three. The process continues until the last drop of solid to solidify is heavily contaminated with A. There's plenty of everyday evidence that impure liquids freeze in this way. For example, an ice cube is clear near the surface but misty in the core. The water used to make ice normally contains dissolved air. Freezing proceeds from the outside and air is accumulated in the retreating liquid phase. The air cannot escape from the interior of the cube, so when that freezes, the air is trapped in a misty uh, edge of tiny bubbles. A modification of zone refining is zone leveling. This technique is used to introduce controlled amounts of impurity, for example, of indium into germanium. A sample rich in the required dopant is put at the head of the main sample and made molten. The zone is then dragged repeatedly in alternate directions through the sample where it deposits a uniform distribution of the impurity. And finally for this chapter, let's wrap up with the Nernst distribution law. Suppose we shake a compound up with a mixture of two immiscible liquids and allow the two phases to separate into layers, like in a biphase extraction. What can be said about the relative concentration of the compound in the two layers? This question can be answered by making use of the chemical potential. For an equilibrium, the chemical potential of the compound chemical potential C, must be the same in each phase, where chemical potential of C of 1 must equal the chemical potential C of 2. Phase 1 and phase 2, that is. If we suppose that each solution is an ideal dilute solution, it follows that the chemical potential in phase 1 plus RT times the natural log of the molar fraction of C in phase one equals the chemical potential of C in phase two plus RT natural log mole fraction of C in phase two. The two standard states are different because we are using Henry's law to define the chemical potentials and the constants that occur in that law vary between solvents. It follows that we can rearrange so that the natural log of the ratio of the mole fractions in phases 1 and 2 equal the chemical potential in phase 1 minus the chemical potential in phase 2 divided by RT. The right-handed side is a constant for a given pair of liquids, so we arrive at the Nernst distribution law, where the mole fraction in phase 2 over the mole fraction in phase 1 is a constant. That is, regardless of the overall concentration, but provided the solutions are both behaving ideally, the ratio of mole fractions in the two phases is the same. For instance, suppose a certain amount of benzoic acid is shaken up in a mixture of benzene and water. Then the acid distributes itself between the two phases such that the ratio of mole fractions is equal to a constant. If twice that amount of acid is shaken into the mixture, the ratio of mole fractions will be the same. And that wraps up our discussion on chapter 6. So I'll get this one uploaded and get everybody some practice problems associated with the chapter, and then we'll be moving on to chapter 7. Have a good day.